Hello and welcome back to One Climate's coverage of the United Nations Climate Talks here in Tianjin, China. I'm delighted to say that I've been joined by Emily and Thomas of the uh, Adopt and Negotiator project. They've uh, been tracking uh, negotiators from China and from France for the last week and uh, they've also got some uh, other interesting insights uh, to uh, what happens in these talks and uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit of an insight from China as well, uh, hopefully from Emily. So I'm going to start by, by talking to you, Emily, because I know that this is your first um, UN climate conference and I wanted to get your, your impressions because it's quite a, a bewildering uh, thing from the outside, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, what, what do you make of it? Well, I can, it's very organized, but really like a um, complicated one because like I'm there being in like very international big meeting, but this meeting is kind of a um, lot of information going on, a lot of meetings going on. I need to figure out which one to attend, which one to get the information from. But um, I got to say like this is totally new to me and I really want to figure out what it is. Right. It's, it's new. And uh, Thomas, I know that you've, you've attended these events before. You were in Copenhagen in uh, uh, December last year, which was this kind of massive um, uh, climate negotiation that was supposed to kind of uh, solve the, the problem. Um, uh, what's, your, what's your take on these talks? Is, is this a very different experience to Copenhagen? And kind of try and give our viewers a bit of a picture of what it's like, uh, you, what happens at, at the UN climate talks. Well, this one is much more smaller, that's, that's a fact. Uh, so it's quite easier to, to find where you are, but still it's a massive uh, meeting and it's quite difficult to understand where and what's happening uh, everywhere. So it's still, it's still uh, comparable to, to, to what happened in Copenhagen. Uh, and first, because uh, many meetings are closed, closed room. So from the civil society, you can't know what's happened inside. So for me, it's totally different because when I was in Copenhagen, I was in an in official delegation, so I could have access to all these uh, closed meetings. So, well, that's the difference for me. Okay, so you've got these, these these big talks that happen, and all the countries from around the world come, and they, they come into these meetings to try and solve the problems. And then there's people from kind of civil society, like just normal people who uh, care about climate change, who come as well, and they're trying to uh, like make make sure that the, the governments are doing the right thing. But we're not always allowed into the big meetings. Um, and uh, you guys, at the moment, you're, you're working for a project called adoptandnegotiator.org, aren't you? Uh, can you give me a quick description? What, what does adoptandnegotiator.org do? It's like uh, as a negotiator, or as an adoptive negotiator tracker of your country, you have to track your delegates and see what's the process, what's their reaction or response to the meeting, and, and get some information to the readers. Like uh, mostly, my readers are the peers in China. Okay, so you're following your negotiators around the talks from your countries. Why? <laughs> to, to, to try to know, uh, to push if uh, the position from our country is good, um, to say publicly that uh, this or that uh, is really bad for a global point of view on climate change. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a pressure on our delegation, so we hope to have some uh, consequences on what our government choose in the uh, final point. Okay, and, and is it easy? Is it, is it difficult? Because uh, we're sitting here just behind the camera, we see kind of delegates walking past and you know, people going to meetings. Like, how easy is it to, to kind of uh, follow your delegation? Well, I have to admit it's kind of challenging. First of all, it's kind of new. I don't know them all, but secondly, it's kind of a Chinese culture thing. Um, it's kind of tricky because it's in China and the Chinese delegates are like kind of highly secure. You want to track someone, it's like different culture here. But I think it's easier for me because I got all the media, press information instead of other people. So it's kind of challenging, but I hope like it will be better in Cancun. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it's quite difficult to track the Chinese delegation. What's your experience <laughs> been with the French delegation, Thomas? The beginning was quite difficult as well because I didn't know anyone actually from the de French delegation. So I had to establish the first contacts and so now it's going better but still it's not easy because uh, they tell you what they want to say and uh, actually you have to find out uh, other information from other de uh, delegations to cross uh, the, the information and to be sure that uh, what your delegation is saying is, is, is right. Okay, so we, we've been here for a week now and you've been do, doing your best to, to follow what your, your, your countries have been saying in these talks. Um, what, what's China's position here, Emily? And it's a big question and it's yeah. difficult, but so climate change, like I know in, in lots of parts of the world, it's like it's a really controversial issue. And um, in China, it's uh, like 
what, what, well, maybe the, maybe that's a, a better question to ask first. What's the attitude in China to climate change? Is it is it complicated or? Like people are all supportive about climate change. People think actions about like emission production uh, reduction, and I think China's done a lot, uh, responding from like how much carbon emission reduction we have like promised, and we are doing well about it. But uh, I think the comments I got from outside like China is not speaking about it because like it's kind of Chinese culture or like it's a different strategy. I don't understand it totally. Uh -huh. Yeah, but like uh, nobody people like civil society are really, really doing well about it. Okay, so China is it is doing a lot to try and reduce its emissions, but nobody knows. Um, I think like Copenhagen, like people say China was blocking Copenhagen, China is blocking Tianjin, but that's different from what we see because we are actually doing a lot. We are doing a lot of sacrifice, but um, from my point, like the negotiation kind of um, pushing China a lot about MRV, which we shouldn't do. What's MRV? Uh, it's memorable, reportable, and verif verifiable. verifiable. Yeah, yeah. So it's like China is is promising to make certain emissions cuts, and other countries want to, or, or it's, it's promising to reduce the intensity of its emissions. Is that right? It's promising to. Yeah, it, he made a promise like in Copenhagen, but uh, that was not obligated. So it's like well, um, volunteering shouldn't be obligated like as MRV. Okay. Yeah. So it said we're going to do this voluntarily, yeah. but. Yeah. But you're not gonna, you're not allowed to come and check, yeah. check up on us, okay? And that's called, some people are upset. Is it America who thinks that's not right? And <laughs> yeah. it's a bit of tension, okay? Yeah. And so, what's happened this week with, with your country? Obviously, China's hosting these yeah. talks, and so it's a, a, like a, a quite a, a, a big occasion. And there's lots mm -hmm. of focus on, on your yeah. government. Has there been any shift in their position, or has the, okay. the talks moved forward? Do you think? Uh, like in opening, like the the leader of the Chinese delegation said, we are flexible. We can discuss it. But I think from the response I get from other people, it's still very like strict to the position. So I'm not sure whether it's like moving forward because like IOCA meetings are closed. So I'll try to get more information with other people. Okay, so it's a, a, a I guess it makes it difficult for for your for your job to follow these negotiations because lots of them you're not allowed into. Yeah. You're not they're closed. So. But on the whole, do you think it's been a successful week or do you think it's been kind of a, a typical kind of week of UN negotiations or have we gone backwards? What's your impression? Uh, I think it's kind of like a huge challenge for China to host this meeting like during a national holiday where like 30,000 people get married here in Tianjin, it's the only city. It's kind of challenging, but I didn't expect too much progress through in this Tianjin process, but it's kind of going smoothly. And hope it will be like build a very good platform for Cancun. Okay, yeah. so it hasn't gone too badly. Yeah. And uh, Thomas, what's your impression been? We've kind of we've been here for a week now, and uh, sometimes you're hoping for like a really big move forward, and then you, you, you <laughs> it will solve the climate crisis. Uh, obviously, uh, that's not going to happen. But have we have we made some progress? Apparently, yes, but uh, very slowly, uh, because uh, from the previous uh, meetings in Bonn uh, during June and July uh, this year, uh, well, they move uh, backwards. So now we just uh, at the back at the point where we started at the. the after Copenhagen, actually. So uh, there is still a, a huge amount of work to do uh, to finalize. Um, what we could hope would be uh, um, decisions, major decisions uh, taken in, in Cancun, so uh, such that um, uh, next year in 2000, uh, 2011, uh, they will be able to work on a, on a global treaty which could be uh, adopted uh, in the next um, conference of parties, which uh, would be in uh, South Africa, I think. Okay, so we're hoping to kind of yeah. make some progress towards the next big climate talks in, exactly. in December this year in, in Cancun, Mexico, and then maybe seal a, a global agreement on climate change in, exactly. in South Africa. Whew, big, it's a big, big ask. Now, your, your um, project adoptandnegotiator.org, it's a, it's a website, and mm -hmm. as well as following your um, negotiators around, you, you write blogs yeah. uh, to make sure the world knows what they're doing. So if, you, if our viewers would like to check that out, then they can go to adoptandnegotiator.org. Um, blogging in China mm -hmm. is not, <laughs> it's not always perceived to be easy. Like for, for us mm -hmm. coming here, uh, we've been uh, faced lots of challenges to, with our technical equipment because there's no access to YouTube, there's no access to Facebook, there's no access to Twitter. Lots of the tools that we we'll normally use are blocked by, by the Chinese government on the internet. And, and then there's censorship as well. Certain stories are, are not allowed coverage in, in the international media. Do all of these pose difficulties for you, Emily, or do you just 
you are used to it and you know what you can write and what you can't write? How does it work? I mean, it's kind of um, a country's pattern. You got to see it to figure out how to do it. Like I plug very happily because like I have like Chinese Facebook, which is Ren Ren. I have Chinese YouTube, which is called Youku, so I can get every access to what I want, like from my own culture, from my own like ways. And blogging in English in like Adopt Negotiator is like totally okay for me because like no one, I think no one is, has ever deleted one of my like blogs and in my own like blogs in China, Chinese Ren Ren, um, all my posts and blogs are okay. So I guess you have to figure out what is the pattern inside and figure out how you can do it smoothly in China. And so what, what do, do you kind of be careful how you write things or do you change words or do okay. you, what, how, how do, what does it mean on a practical level as to what, what changes about the way, the way you write? Um, for me, there's no change. It's, it's like needed to make it. But if you want to write something about democracy, like self-voting or something, maybe you can change the words. For example, you can change, like, um, add something, plug, um, like, you can you can add a word to it so the censorship won't, like, won't scan it. But um, you can also find a way to rephrase it. I guess that's how it works. Okay, so you yeah. feel that you can be honest from these yeah. talks, you don't have any yeah. problems, that's good. And uh, Thomas, how have you found the blogging? What, what style of, of blogging do you think kind of helps people understand this process? Because it's incredibly technical. Like you can try and write about um, the United Nations climate talks or you can use an acronym, the United Nations Framework Conventional Climate Change, or you change that to UNFCCC and you know you write three sentences and you realise you've used six acronyms and it, all of a sudden it becomes impossible to understand. So you know, how do you try and make this kind of this ginormous process accessible to people on the outside? It's not easy. Uh, <laughs> I choose uh, to, to follow one chapter because there are many chapters discussed currently. Uh, I choose to follow mainly uh, everything on finance and uh, French position on finance, such that I, I've written uh, a, a few articles on that, um, on that chapter trying to, to explain one after one uh, what's going on, what are the main issues, what are the, the main progress and what are the problems uh, for France uh, or due to France. Uh, so it's my way but we, we have our, our way um, which is really personal for, for each, uh, each tracker. So <laughs> I think uh, yeah, we try to manage and try to, to, to communicate uh, as we can but it's really a difficult task. Okay, now Thomas, I want to ask you a little bit about Copenhagen because I know that you were in the delegation um, for Mali and Copenhagen was um, a big kind of uh, climate conference in uh, December of last year and it was hyped up around the world. It was going to solve climate change. This was our last chance. All the world's governments came together and all the world leaders came together for this huge, huge conference and uh, it didn't it didn't work uh, <laughs> it didn't solve climate change and as as you were working within a government I, I guess you must have had some quite interesting insights into what happened and and you know some interesting thoughts i hope as to what went wrong so perhaps you could you know what what was it like being in copenhagen for you well first i was working for the administration which is not the government oh. <laughs> there are different levels and uh, even communications between uh, government and uh, administration are difficult, is difficult. So uh, I was working as a part of the, the official uh, team of negotiators uh, for Mali, as you said. Uh, what was interesting for me was um, that I, could, I was able to attend all the, these coordination groups uh, of parties, uh, which are... Um, uh, African group or G77 plus China. Mm -hmm. we, these are coordination which are closed to all um, other parties. Mm -hmm. So um, I attended that and what was really obvious is the lack of trust between developing countries in a general uh, view and developed countries. Mm -hmm. And we, we, well after Copenhagen we hope uh, that um, this trust could be rebuilt, but now we know that it's not. It's not rebuilt. Why? Why is there a lack of trust? There is a lack of trust because uh, some countries are using a procedure to to uh, push their views, and some countries are not able to to defend themselves. So 
it's it's kind of um, well, for example, on finance, to be clear, uh, in Copenhagen, um, all developed countries um, said we are going to, to give you, to all developing countries, $30 billion uh, during 2010, 11 and 12, so in three years. And now we know that um, for 2010, uh, the 10 billions are officially on the table. Mm -hmm. But in fact, they aren't because they choose uh, definitions of um, what we call additionality, uh, which means uh, they are supposed to put new money and, and to increase the global amount of finance to, on climate change. But the, the definition they choose um, help them to just uh, uh, take um, money from official development aid and to put it in uh, climate change. So that uh, in the developing countries doesn't have um, more money. They just have the same amount of money. So they, they feel that, um, they feel that uh, the, the, the developed countries lied to them in Copenhagen. I can, I can understand why, um, why poorer countries would, would um, be mistrusting or, or would, wouldn't trust rich countries if, if rich countries had promised to, to give them money for climate change and then they hadn't. But why should rich countries give poor countries money anyway? Why, why, why you know, m many of our viewers will be watching this thinking, well, you know, this is a difficult economic time for, uh, for, for us and you know, people are losing their jobs in rich countries, getting really big tax cuts. Why should people be paying poor countries money to cope with climate change? First of all, just notice that when the Copenhagen Agreement uh, has been signed, we were already in the middle of crisis. So developed countries definitely knew that uh, this could be difficulties for them. So if they can't afford that, they shouldn't promise it mm -hmm. first. But uh, the main point uh, um, is that uh, climate changes are happening right now and it has consequences um, on on a lot of uh, developing countries look at what happened in, in Pakistan or even in China with floods everywhere, for example. But there are many, many different kind of examples. So they need help first to, to have a quick reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, we asked as developed countries, all the least developed countries to, to build um, what we call um, adaptation plans, like it was at the beginning of um, two, 2000. And until now, there is no money for them to implement their, their plan. Mm -hmm. So in the Copenhagen uh, Agreement, uh, money for developing countries was like um, a way to prove that the world and develop, developed world wants to move forward. Mm -hmm. So if we, it's, it's kind of, yes, legitimate, I mm -hmm. think. Okay, I want to find out a little bit about attitudes towards climate change in your countries now, um, because uh, it's a subject that causes lots of controversy and is, is causes lots of uh, tension in, in the UK where I'm from. Uh, you get some people who believe in climate change and you get some people who are vehemently, vehemently, you know, they think it's not true or they think it's a conspiracy or they think that um, it's, if it is true it's not man-made and we can't do anything anyway. Um, so just tell me in China, what's is there a, a big division of opinion about whether climate change is real or not or you know, what do people think? Well, there's a like, national policy called sustainable development, uh -huh. which means that we are a developing country, we're not that much like, um, okay, environment is changing, blah, 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 blah. But actually, we care about the environment because it's related to development. Uh -huh. So the Chinese are very supportive to help like developing with like um, the very sustainable ways to protect the environment from getting hurt. So I guess like that's the Chinese situation while like it has to relate to the economy or development with the development, like um, how to protect the environment. But people like um, people are debating about whether climate change is real or is affecting China, but we can all feel that uh, the climate is changing, like extreme weather get, get more. So um, I think a lot of people like they really believe in climate change, but they want to focus like at the same time focus on development. So mm -hmm. that's what we call sustainable development in China. And do you think China's managing to develop sustainably? Like yeah. here in Tianjin, one of the things that um, has caused like a lot of surprise amongst mm -hmm. uh, visitors is the air quality, like the, s the smog yeah. outside. It's really shocking. You can't, you can't see more than 500 meters sometimes because mm -hmm. yeah. the air is just thick and gray with, with, with pollution. Mm -hmm. And do you think that you know, this, this shows the kind of problem that China is facing? Will, will these kinds of issues um, 
encourage people to, to look for renewable energies or mm -hmm. which what, what path is China taking do you mm -hmm. think? Well, if you take back to UK, maybe like 100 years ago, there's the same situation there. Like you are developing, you have to use the industry and like you don't get the money for like very sustainable, how to deal with the pollution. So this happens. We have to admit that China is still developing and facing many challenges. But the good thing is like there have been technology to help develop better and more sustainable. So like China is more, more focusing on how to use like technology and how to use sustainable energy to help China to you know, to add up the process of like using better energy instead of like using going the same old way as UK does. Uh -huh. So I think that's a better way. Like people are really trying to be more sustainable and like environmentally friendly. Okay. Yeah. And obviously the political system in China mm -hmm. is very different to, yeah. to in the UK and the, I think the government maybe has more power. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that it can kind of impose mm -hmm. solutions more easily? So if the, if the government decides climate mm -hmm. change is a problem and we're going to prioritize it, mm -hmm. does that mean it can just solve it? I'm not from a government, so I'm not sure about <laughs> question, but I think a very interesting point is that whenever Chinese government like um, promise to get something done, it's done. But if in UK or like America, like you have like democracy, you make a promise here, maybe you can just vote like we don't do it there. If like Obama is on like like Bush is gone, the things may change or vary in like different democracy countries. But in China, like if the government makes a process of making a promise, it may probably get done like much better than other countries. That's mm -hmm. my view, but only my personal view. Yeah. yeah. And Thomas, what about in France? Like, do you have the same kind of um, divide about climate change? Or there, is there a, a large group of people who think that this isn't true and who get really angry about it? Or it, does everybody believe it? What's the situation? Um, before Copenhagen, I think in general, um, everybody was uh, agreeing uh, that climate change is happening due to, to human made uh, consequences. But um, well, at, actually, there was uh, at least one, two, three people um, who have a lot of access um, to, to media, to mm -hmm. the media, uh, who are denying that. Mm -hmm. And um, now, just after Copenhagen, um, they pushed a lot mm -hmm. and they, they, well, they made a lot of uh, demonstration um, and trying to, to convince that uh, it's not human made and uh, we shouldn't have anything to do with that. I think it's a psychological reaction. Uh, we didn't solve the, the problem in Copenhagen, so let's consider that there is no problem. It's easier, so everybody feel, uh, feels better. Uh, so there is, like in the UK, a controversy. But um, I think the government and um, in general um, um, the scientists, well, for, it's sure for scientists, but I think the government now is really convinced and is trying to, to act uh, really. Okay, and so what, what do you think uh, we should hope for then? Because we've said that in China there's these uh, real difficulties between development and uh, environment and the uh, tension that you face because obviously it's important that you develop, and, but maybe you have to use coal-fired power stations in order to give people electricity. And in France, you have controversy about whether climate change is real or not. And then in America, you have controversy over the politics. And every country you look at at these talks, and there's, there's a lot of countries here, every country you look at has its own internal difficulties and tensions. Are we going to are we going to get a solution to this? And and how 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 hopeful should we be? And is 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 the UN the arena where we'll solve it? Um, well, I think in China, like we are already taking the actions, but we are hoping the like US or other countries to like cooperate more so we can move forward. Like this, um, the Chinese word harmonious is very popular in China. It's a national policy. Like uh, we trust each other. We're trying to get things done smoothly. That's the thing China is hoping. But um, I think my personal point of view, like you cannot just push someone who is not able to get meat who is starving to like stop eating meat to get vegetable to be veg to protect the environment so i hope like the people can understand chinese situation more and like really cooperate like we also push ourselves but we're trying to cooperate more to get the things done so i guess like i'm hoping for a more harmonious cooperation or negotiation maybe it's not possible okay yeah. thomas well i agree with uh, emily because um the main responsibility is from uh, developed countries. Uh, it's historical responsibility. Now the future, we have to make it together because um, now China is the first polluter in terms of uh, uh, CO2. But uh, but uh, in the historical responsibility, it's for us. Mm -hmm. So uh, to build it together, the the main actors currently are China and the US. The US and China have both the key, and they need 
to everybody needs that China and the US find a solution together to act. And the EU um, and other developed countries will follow. And we have to make more, um, more efforts uh, as well because it's not enough. Clearly, it's not enough, even in the EU. But um, I think we can find a way. Um, for what I have seen here, um, I guess that China and the US, once more, are willing to, to, to find a, a way, a solution, even if it's difficult um, on the national scene for, for Obama, and even if it's difficult for China uh, due to, to his phase of, of development, but they are really concerned uh, with the climate change. So, in, in a sense, I'm quite positive optimists. But still, uh, the UNFCCC uh, has been created uh, 18 years ago now, so uh, now we have to move fast. <laughs> okay, 18 years of talks. Um, maybe I'll finish, Emily. You, you, you mentioned by saying that uh, when China wants to achieve something, it normally does it. Like, and, and it, visiting this country, mm -hmm. you, you get that impression very strongly. Like, uh, if it wants to build a conference centre, <laughs> it builds the most massive and impressive conference centre you could possibly imagine. If it wants to build a train station, it builds a massive and impressive train station. And, uh, bullet trains, every, when it wants to do something, it does it. Could it be a, a, a leader in, in terms of climate change? Could China really change the, the way the world economy works, the way that our societies are shaped? Because if China says this is, this is a problem and we don't care about what America thinks, we're gonna, you know, we're, they're already investing hugely in renewables. They're the world's leading investor in renewables, world's leading uh, investor in wind, solar. If China says we're gonna we're gonna sort this out, could it sort it out for the whole world? I'm not sure uh, I get the question correctly, but I think first of all, like China is willing to take the actions, but not necessarily leader, because like it's Chinese culture, we don't want to be a very aggressive. We believe that people should do their own work and we can cooperate. That's the cooperation instead of like being leader and compete with each other. The climate is not a race like you are the winner and other people are losers. It's not a situation. The Chinese people is trying to build a better world for the future instead of trying to be the number one in the race. I think mm -hmm. that's the Chinese culture instead of the American culture. It's different. Uh -huh. Yeah, but I think China is like willing to do more because like. It's our nature to get a better environment, get a better future. So, is that your question? Yeah. Okay, guys, it's been an interesting discussion. I think I'll, um, I'll leave it there. Okay. And uh, uh, maybe uh, we'll have some news updates from you later on in the day if there's any uh, big movement from China here which uh, sees these UN talks uh, come to a, a positive conclusion. Uh, you can uh, join us again uh, in a few hours. We're going to be following the final day of these talks here in Tianjin uh, in China. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, kind of touch and go as to whether there's uh, going to be much progress but we're keeping our fingers crossed for uh, uh, a positive outcome here so uh, uh, I'll end there and uh, maybe we'll see you in a few hours time.